The fundamental process of knowing what information you need and gathering it is one of the keys to living the good life. Some of the best advice Mr. Schoff gave me in those early years was why and how to study. That's a key word for life change, study. If you wish to be successful, study success. If you wish to be happy, study happiness. Happiness is not an accident. It is first a study and then a practice. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Would you like to guess how many people make wealth a study? Right, very few. Surely, since wealth and happiness and success are all values to cultivate, you would naturally assume that most people would make a careful study of them. Why they do not is yet another example of those aspects of life that fall into the category of mysteries of the mind. Remember, major keys to your better future are going to be ideas and information. If we have any lack, it is not because we lack money or opportunity or resources. It is because we lack ideas that have taken form from information. Many years ago, I learned that some of the best advice ever given comes from the Bible. There's a phrase in that amazing book that says, If you search, you will find. So that is the way to discover ideas and life-changing information. Search. In order to find, you must search. You must go to the seminars and to the training classes. You must listen to the cassette programs that can give you breakthrough ideas. You must go and engage in conversations with people of substance. You must go looking, go searching. Rarely does a good idea interrupt you. And as you make a diligent search, you will find just the ideas you need. Now, here is the next key word in the process of seeking information that can change your life, and that word is capture. When you find a good idea, capture it. Don't trust your memory. Capture everything. Write it down. Record it. This is one of the reasons why we have put this program on cassette tapes to capture the ideas. As a serious student of wealth and happiness, I would encourage you to make use of a journal as a gathering place for all the ideas that come your way. I consider personal journals to be one of the three treasures a wise person will leave behind. Here are those three treasures. One is your photographs. Take a lot of pictures. Being able to capture the event in a fraction of a second is a phenomenon of the 20th century and how easy it is to take phenomena for granted. I've gone to Taiwan to lecture three times in the last three years. On my last trip, there were about a thousand people in attendance for a weekend seminar. Now, if there were 1,000 people in the room, guess how many cameras were also in the room? Right, 1,000. Everyone brings a camera to capture all the events and the people, new friends, new experiences. I spend a big part of my time having my picture taken with everyone. Have you ever looked at the pictures a couple of generations back? Unfortunately, there are only a handful. But wouldn't it be great if there were hundreds of pictures to tell the whole story? So make sure you leave behind your whole story in your treasure of pictures. The next treasure to leave behind is your library. All the books you have chosen. Books well read, well underlined, with notes and observations and reflections you have written in the margins. The books that have helped shape your philosophy and the values of your life. That is a treasure, your library. And your listening library, too. All these terrific cassettes. They are a treasure. The third treasure to leave behind is perhaps the most important. And that is your journals, containing all the ideas you have captured in your lifetime. Business ideas, social ideas, culture ideas, investment ideas, lifestyle ideas. Can you imagine the value these journals would have? They will certainly be more valuable to leave behind to your children than your couch. So get serious about your search for information and ideas and about leaving that information behind for future generations. Here is the next key word for expanding your life for the better. That word is review. Go back over all your life experiences. Learn a skill called reflection. Pondering life's events with the intent of learning. That is so important. I call it running the tapes again. 
The events of your life are some of the best sources of information. Don't merely go through your days. Get from your days. Be aware of what's going on around you so that you will drive the grooves in the record of that day deep into your consciousness. Here are some good times to reflect. First, at the end of the day, take a few minutes and go back over your day. Where you went and what you did and what you said, what worked and what didn't. What do you want to do again? What do you want to correct? The colors, the sights, the sounds, the conversations, the experiences. You see, experience can become commodity, currency, coin, an incredible source of value. But only if you take time to reflect on the experience and turn it into something of value. As we mentioned in our first fundamental, it's not what happens that makes the difference in how your life works out, but rather what you do about what happens. And part of doing something about what happens is this process of reflection, studying an event in order to glean valuable information from it. Another time to reflect is at the end of the week. Take a few hours. Take a half a day at the end of the month. Take a weekend at the end of the year. Reason? To make the past more valuable. Sophisticated people have learned how to gather up the past and invest it in the future. When my father was about to celebrate his 76th birthday, I said to him, Father, can you imagine what it's going to be like to gather up the last 75 years and invest them in your 76th? That's how life can become productive and exciting. Not just living one more year, but gathering up the years and investing them in the next one. By reflecting, you can gather up all the conversations you have ever had and invest all that you have learned and all that you have felt in the next conversation. Gather all your experiences and invest all that you have learned and felt in your next experience. And the more value, the more substance, the more information, the more wisdom you can gather from all of your yesterdays, the more exciting your future becomes. Probably all of us already know all that we need to know in order to make our lives turn out the way we want, except for one thing, how to gather what we've learned in order to invest it in what we want to become. So start a new discipline that can lead to wealth and happiness. Find out how things work. Never let it be said you didn't find out. Now let me give you a qualifying phrase. You may not be able to do all you find out, but make sure you find out all you can do. You don't want to wind up at the end of your life and find out that you lived only one-tenth of it, and the other nine-tenths went down the drain. Not for lack of opportunity, but for lack of information. Let me share with you two of the best sources of information available. First, as we have mentioned, learn from your own experiences. Become a good student of your own life. It's the information you are most familiar with and feel the strongest about. So make your own life one of your most important studies. And in studying your own life, be sure to study the negative as well as the positive, your failures as well as your successes. Our so-called failures serve us well when they teach us valuable information. They're frequently better teachers than our successes. One of the ways we learn how to do something right is simply by doing it wrong. Doing it wrong is a great school for learning. Now I would suggest that you not take too long. If you've done it wrong for 10 years, I wouldn't suggest another 10. But what a close at hand and emotionally impactful way to learn from your own experiences. When I met Mr. Schoff, I had been working six years. I started when I was 19, and when I met him, I was 25. He said to me, Mr. Rohn, you have been working now for six years. How are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, then I suggest you not do that anymore. Six years is long enough to operate the wrong plan. Next he asked, how much money have you saved in the last six years? I said, not any. He said, who sold you on that plan six years ago? What a fantastic question. Where did I get my present plan that wasn't working well? 
Hey, everyone has bought someone's plan. The question is, whose? Whose plan have you bought? Now, those initial confrontations as you come to grips with your own past experiences may be a little painful at first, especially if you have made as many errors as I did. But think of the progress you can make when you have finally confronted those errors by becoming a better student of your own life. Now, the next way to learn is from other people's experiences. And remember, you can learn from other people whether they have done it right or wrong. You can learn from negative as well as positive. The Bible is such a great book because it is a collection of human stories on both sides of the ledger. One list of human stories is called examples, do what these people did. And the other list of human stories is called warnings, don't do what these clods did. What a wealth of information, what to do and what not to do. I think it also means, however, that if your story ever gets in somebody's book, make sure they use it as an example, not a warning. There are three ways to learn from other people. The first is to listen to the cassettes and read the books by and about people who've accomplished great things. All the successful people I know and work with around the world are good readers. They just read, read, read. They are so curious that they are driven to read because they just have to know. It is one of the things they all have in common. Here's a good phrase. All leaders are readers. And they use cassette programs too, especially while they're in the car or during other times when they can't read. Cassettes can help all of us easily pick up new ideas and new skills. Did you know there are cassettes and books on how to be stronger, more decisive, a better speaker, a more effective leader, have a better effect on other people? become more loving, develop personality, get rich, develop influence, become sophisticated, and people don't use them? How would you explain that? Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and told how they did it on cassettes like this and people don't want to listen? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. He says, well, yeah, if you worked where I work, by the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV, and get to bed. You can't stay up half the night and read, read, read. And this is the guy that's behind on his bills. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But remember, you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broke, confused, and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good reader, a good listener. At least he could hear a good cassette on the way home, right? Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Half rich isn't bad. 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key, every day, don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. There's a Bible phrase that says, humans cannot live on bread alone or food alone. It says the next most important thing to bread is words. Words nourish the mind, words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day. I told my staff one day, some people read so little, they have rickets of the mind. And also remember, to properly feed the mind, you must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Here is a thought. Why not call good books and cassettes tapping the treasure of ideas? That's it, tapping the treasure of ideas, like you're doing with this program. And if somebody's got a good excuse for not tapping the treasure of ideas for at least 30 minutes every day, or spending the money and getting the books and cassettes, I'd like to hear it. Some excuses you wouldn't believe. I say, John, I've got this gold mine. I've got so much gold, I don't know what to do with it all. Come on over and dig. John says, I don't have a shovel. I say, well, John, get you one. He says, do you know what they want for shovels? 
Hey, invest the money. Get the cassettes and books. The best money you can spend is money invested in your self-education. Don't shortchange yourself when it comes to investing in your own better future. Mr. Shof got me started on my library when I first met him. He said to me, become self-educated. Standard education will get you standard results. Check those numbers and see if that's what you want. And if it isn't, if you want something better than standard, you must become self-educated. So I went to work on my library, and I now have one of the best. Shof recommended a couple of books in particular to get me started. Now, I had a Bible, that's 66 books, so that was a pretty good start, and my parents saw to it that I had a good study of the Bible. But the first book Mr. Shof told me to get was the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you don't already have it, it's a great one to add to your library. Earl Nightingale has put it on cassette. The title should intrigue you, Think and Grow Rich. I read it several dozen times. Shof said repetition is the mother of skill. And if you could have seen my bank account at the time, you would have known I needed lots of that kind of repetition. Some of the ideas in that book made major changes in my life. As I look back now, the book was worth thousands, and I bought it for pennies. I learned a very valuable lesson. There can be a great deal of difference between cost and value. Before I met Mr. Shof, I used to ask, how much does it cost? After I met him, however, I soon learned to ask, how much is it worth? I started basing my life on worth instead of cost, and everything changed. So that was one book he recommended, Think and Grow Rich. The next book he recommended I get was a book on nutrition. Shof said, study nutrition. Vitality plays an important part in doing well. Some people don't do well because they don't feel well. It's not that they're not intelligent. It's that they're ill. They don't have the fire and the vitality to do well. So he really got on me about nutrition. Now, some of those health books are a bit weird, but you can separate out the weird stuff. There are cassettes on nutrition, too. Remember, don't be a follower. Be a student. Someone says, I read this book. Should I follow? And the answer is no. Read at least two books and make up your own mind. Don't be a follower. Be a student. So take care of yourself. There's a Bible phrase that says, many times the spirit is willing, but the body's weak. So you have to work on both. You wake up in the morning and the mind says, let's go get them. And the body says, I can't even get out of bed. So work on your health. A person's library of books and cassettes reveals his or her most dominant desires. It's interesting to walk into someone's house and browse through the library. What does your library say about you? So, read all the books. Now, here's good news. You don't have to read them all at once. Try this. Two books a week in ten years is a thousand books. If you read a thousand books in the next ten years, do you think they would greatly influence all the dimensions of your life? The answer is, of course. Well, here's what's exciting. It's only two books a week. However, I would suggest if you haven't read two books a week for the last ten years, you are about a thousand books behind. Can you imagine the incredible disadvantage it will be ten years from now? to stride into the marketplace a thousand books behind? For some confrontations, you won't be a match. And for some opportunities, your knowledge will be too lacking. For some values, your philosophy will be too shallow. Missing skills, missing knowledge, missing insights, missing values, missing lifestyle. It could happen if you don't read the books. Remember, the book you don't read won't help. You can't read too many books, but you can read too few. Now, the next way to learn from others is to listen. Become a great listener. Get around successful people and listen. Listen to what they say and listen to how they say it. There is something to be said for style as well as content. And never has listening to successful people been easier or less costly than it is today. With cassettes like the one you're listening to now, 
You can own cassette programs by and about the most successful people in any field. And you can listen to their ideas while you do something else. While driving your car, exercising, getting dressed in the morning, anytime. Listen over and over again until their ideas become your ideas, their inspiration, your inspiration. A lot of the books you're anxious to read, such as Think and Grow Rich, have been condensed and narrated on cassette. Your cassette library of great authors and ideas can be the investment with the greatest return of all. Great cassettes will do more than teach you great ideas. They'll also remind you of the important things you already know but sometimes forget. They'll lift your spirit. They'll keep your mind on what's important, on your goal and how you can achieve it. And what a modest investment for the seeds of fortune. Ideas well-written, well-spoken, well-received, well-learned, and well-invested can be your driving life force for wealth and happiness. Here's another way to succeed by listening. Choose a really successful person and take him or her out to dinner and listen. Ask questions and listen. If a man is poor, he can really help himself by taking a rich person out to dinner and listening. Spend fifty, sixty, eighty, or a hundred dollars. Go for the full nine courses. Start with the hors d'oeuvres. Ask questions. The salad takes fifteen minutes. Keep the conversation going. The biggest steak in town takes forty-five minutes. Keep it rolling. Ask more questions. Pour on the dessert. Stretch the meal about two hours. See if you get someone successful to eat and talk for two hours. He or she may drop ideas in your lap that could change your life. Multiply your income by two, by three, by five. But you're right. Poor people don't usually take rich people out to dinner. That's the problem. The man says if he's rich, let him buy his own dinner. I'm not coming up with any money. And besides, if you worked where I work, by the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV, and get to bed. You can't spend all that time trying to find a rich man to feed. And this man's behind on his installment payments. Behind. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But remember, you can work hard and be sincere all your life and wind up broke and unhappy. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good listener. The third way to learn from others is to observe. Watch what successful people do. Here's why. Success leaves clues. Watch how the man shakes hands. People who do well do certain things over and over and over. And if you're clever, you can pick them up. Don't miss anything that could help you change your life for the better. Be a careful observer. We have covered a lot of ideas in this part, but what a major fundamental to wealth and happiness. The consistent, disciplined, purposeful, constant search for knowledge. It's where the life-changing ideas are. Pursue it with high expectations. Spend the money and time and the effort. They're all investments, time, effort, and money. But the payoff is so great, it's hard to compare the cost to the reward. First is the money, and it does take some money. I have a great suggestion for the cassettes and the books and the lectures, the seminars and the videos you need for a constant flow of ideas and inspiration. Set up an educational fund. Take a portion of your income each month and set it aside to invest in all the means of the search for knowledge. Remember, the best money spent is the money spent to cultivate the genius of your own mind and spirit. Make sure you don't spend more for accommodation than you do for education. The money, small price. The promise, unlimited potential. Next is the time. That is a valuable expenditure. I understand that. To ask people for their money, that's one thing. But to ask them for their time, that's a major request. But I don't know any shortcuts to this. It takes time, precious time. The time you spend is that much less time you have to spend. You can get more money, but you can't get more time. However, 
Life has a unique way of rewarding high investment with high return. This major investment you're making now, listening, could be that small fine-tuning you need for major accomplishment. And last, the investment in effort. There is a great deal of difference in casual listening and serious listening. Listening to know, listening to learn, listening that opens up the whole mental and spiritual process is truly an investment in effort. Bringing heavy attention to bear, that takes effort. A mental rifle shot to strike the idea target, that takes a great deal of concentrated effort. However, this effort, high gear mental machinery, is the effort investment that opens the floodgates where ideas can work their magic for you in the marketplace.